So Proverbs chapter 24 tonight, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 22. And we're still in the midst of the wise sayings here in chapter 24. And remember, there are 30 wise sayings. And it's a collection of these sayings starting in chapter 22 in verse 17 all the way through chapter 24 in verse 22. So tonight we're going to finish the 30 wise sayings of the book of Proverbs. We're going to be picking up with the 25th wise saying in verse 11. It says, deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? What we find here in this proverb, or this 25th saying, if you will, is that God calls us to be people who are aware. Be aware of injustices or the unjust. Be aware of the ways of this world. And remember that it is important for us to be informed but not conformed. I think sometimes we can also lose our place in um, getting caught up in too much of what's going on rather than focusing or centering our attention on the person and work of Christ and what he requires of us, what he calls us to do. But the Lord to a degree says that for us, his children, that we are to be looking out for others, not just in the interests of our own. Remember what Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, that is something that we always talk about, you know, hey, treat others the way you want to be treated. But, but what the Bible is saying here is take this a step further. Consider, perhaps, what others are going through. It doesn't have to be a person in direct relationship with you. If you see an injustice going on, perhaps maybe something wrong or something bad, and you, know, you want to respond to deliver them, if you will, to help them. If they are a victim of such unjust act or something, then yes, of course, this is, this is what he's saying to do. But it also says here, deliver those who are drawn toward death, victims of such injustices. You know, this kind of goes to the thought of what we see in other countries that perhaps, you know, victimize the Christians. And what this does is there is to be those who who go out and who help, who protect, who in some way come alongside to, to protect these people. Now, you know, some people have the notion in their mind, and, and really I'm saying this, that there are some Christians who say things like, well, the reason why they're in danger in that third world country is because they put themselves there. I mean, I wouldn't be a missionary and go there. As if it's their fault. The Bible says we are called to go Yes, we are to be aware that uh, these places might not regard the word of God like we do, and there might be consequences. But just because a person is willing to go and sacrifice doesn't mean that we just leave them to the wolves and just say, well, they should have never went to begin with. No, here, in a sense, you could see that the Bible is saying, you know, in some way, how can you perhaps maybe make them aware if there's a way or a ministry or something that would go and help, kind of like the situation that just recently happened in Afghanistan, where there were so many Christians and Americans, and let's just put it this way, just innocent people, women and children, who were left really for the slaughter. This was unjust. And... The deliverer in that context, like it says here, deliver those who are drawn, help those who are drawn toward death, 
Well, the ones that did it were these 13 soldiers that gave their lives for this. They were there to deliver those who were in harm's way. They were drawn toward death. In other words, the situation created an unjust circumstance and they found themselves on the verge of really death. We can also do the same in our day-to-day -day lives. You could do so, listen to this, by perhaps making a person aware of their present circumstance or situation, kind of like we do in the ministry here at Living Way Fontana. You know, this is a, what we call an inner city ministry, if you don't know by now. Your church is in the hood. <laughs> and people around us here are dying. We see it. In the years that I've been a pastor here for 14 years, I've known people that have come and sat in the same chairs that you're sitting in who have died due to bad decisions and or other things, you know. And so we, in a sense, kind of work this way, too. We make them aware that there is hope and there's a better life and there's a better way of living. So you can kind of, in a sense, take that too, that, that we're called to make people aware and we're called to, to defend and deliver those that are drawn toward death. And we are to hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If we can, do so. In other words, you know, this proverb is saying, don't just be a person who's just worried about yourself and then you have that mindset better them than me. What do you guys have ever heard that before? Yeah, that's not a wise proverb. <laughs> that's a foolish proverb. But, but look at this, very selfish. Then it says here, if you say, surely we did not know this. And some people will say, well, you know, I just didn't really know. Well, you know what that leads to. You know what is there. So go and make them aware. If you say, well, I didn't know, like playing the part, like well, I didn't know. It says, does not he, speaking about the Lord, who weighs the heart, consider it? Doesn't God know? Of course he does. He knows all things. And because we are his children, listen, we're to be seeking the Lord and we're to be asking God, open our eyes, give us discernment, give us wisdom so that we might deliver, right? As many as we can. Listen, people, here's another way of looking at this. Not just so much in helping in dire situations, but what is more dire than this? The world might not see it this way, but we do as a church because it is a spiritual uh, reality I'm about to share right now. What is more dire than, than dying by suicide bomb or by dying in some unjust way or being taken in by the atrocities of life or the evils of this world? What is more dire than that? I'll tell you, there is one thing far greater that is dire, and that is a person dying without Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because you can't undo that unacknowledgement of who Jesus is when you step into eternity. There's no second chance. So part of delivering a person who is drawn toward death, meaning they're going toward that way by their own doing or perhaps being taken captive, so to speak, and or also holding back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Another aspect could be that we are to be preaching the gospel so that they don't receive death, but that they receive life. That rather than receiving the slaughter or the violence, they receive deliverance. So we could never say, we didn't know they were in harm. Anybody that's outside of the will of God is in harm's way. So you can't say you don't know. And it says, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? Man, that's a pretty good thing. So we cannot say, hey, listen, I didn't even know any of this was going on. Now, granted that there might be some things we might not know. But the idea here is making one aware and responding to that awareness. So in other words, another way of looking at this is one who tries to look the other way. One who is trying to perhaps um, maybe think to themselves that, 
you know, as long as I don't pay attention to this, then I won't have to do anything about it. You know, there are some people that just live like that. He goes on to say here this in the rest of verse 12. He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? So if there is an awareness or if there is a knowledge and you overlook it and whatever happens as a result of it, if you think, well, what's happened has already happened and it doesn't matter what I say or do, it's too late now. He's saying you still have to deal with the Lord on what you knew. Because God knew. Now think about this. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, it says every way, verse 2, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. In other words, man's ways and conduct are right in his own eyes, but the Lord knows the heart. We have a good way of, of masking what's on our heart, right, by by outward expressions or words or things that we say, right? Now look at what else it goes on to say here. When you look at this, it says, he will render to each one according to his deeds. See, God knows the heart. People try to use it as, as like a, 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 how could I say, um, a get out of trouble type thing or don't hold me accountable. In other words, I belong to God, not you, and God knows my heart. You know, when people tell me that, I say, yeah, he does, and he's not pleased with it either. So, just news flash. But, but think about this. This has often been used uh, throughout the scriptures that the Lord can, you know, knows the heart of man. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus speaks concerning this very truth that God knows what's in man's heart. Also in Luke chapter 16. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 in Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. And it says because of what's in man's heart, God will deal with him according to his works. So the Lord is truly concerned about the plight of the poor and the helpless. And if God is concerned about that, that's what Matthew 25 is all about. Remember that? If God is concerned about that, then we ourselves should be concerned about this. We should have some type of, you know, thing within us to say, you know, I want to be concerned about the things that, you know, God is concerned about. I always refer back to this song. Um, do you guys remember? Um, I believe the song is called Hosanna. And there's a, a stanza in the song that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom cause. Break my heart for what breaks yours. You know, has anybody ever prayed that? Because it sounds good. It sounds very humble. It sounds actually very spiritual. But does your heart break for what breaks the heart of God. I believe it was A.W. Tozer that say Christians lie the most during praise and worship. They lie the most when they sing. They sing these songs about, you know, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you, oh, alone. Is it every breath that you take? Is it every moment that you're awake? Most likely not. But boy, you can sing a real good one, can't you? Sounds good. You see, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 25. Then he said, then he will also say to those on the left hand, verse 41, depart from me, you who are cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. This is the whole picture here that he will render to each one according to his deeds. Well, he's saying here, this is what you've received for how you've lived your life. Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You, you know, <laughs> everlasting fire was prepared for who? It says the devil and his angels. 
God doesn't send man to hell. We send ourselves there by disobeying. It was never prepared for you and me. But, but he says here is what he's going to give them because of their disobedience. Then he says, here's where they failed. Here's where they faltered. Listen, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? When did we see this? And we didn't minister to you. Then he will answer them and say, sure, assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So in other words, they did not care for God's people. And they didn't care for what God cared for. Their heart didn't break for what broke the heart of God. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, <clears throat> this is clearly a picture of what this proverb is saying here. The idea here is that God will give to each one according to his deeds. And it's a good reminder that we should always live a life and, and really just pray, Lord, give us, you know, one of the good things to pray is this, Lord, give me eyes to see people the way you do. Because if you leave it up to yourself, you're viewing them through the lens of judgment, whether you like them or you don't like them, right? Right? And, and it's funny because like we're Christians and we're supposed to love people, but Christians are like at times the most unloving people. Oh, but we can sure sing a good tune to Jesus. But here's the idea that God sees those things. And we will be rewarded for a lack thereof. You might say reward's supposed to be a good thing. Yeah, I don't think you want this reward. Now he goes on to say here <clears throat> in the 26th saying, verse 13, my son, eat honey because it is good and the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. Now, this is not a saying on all of you here should eat honey because it's good for you. <laughs> it's more of symbolism here. And the idea really is going to uh, take its place in the thought of verse 14. But though I would encourage you here to really listen to what he's saying, honey is beneficial, it is good, and it is desirable. And verse 14 says, So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul, there it is there. Wisdom is like honey that is good and beneficial. It is like the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. Wisdom should be desirable. You see that? If you have found it. Now you should circle that word if. If you have found it, there is, listen to this, a prospect. What does that mean? That means there is a latter end. There is hope for you. How many of you guys need some hope tonight? Okay, practice some wisdom. <laughs> it's there. He, he's saying, it will go well with you. And just so you know, there are, being that it is allergy season right now, right? How many of you guys struggle with allergies? You know one of the quickest ways to deal with allergies? Just go to a local beekeeper. Go get raw honey from the local beekeeper. Eat it. Because what you're allergic to is all the pollen and all the stuff in the air. Well, guess who goes and gathers all that pollen? The bees do. Now you're eating their honey. Guess what? When you breathe it in, it's not going to affect you. It helps you. So it is beneficial even to your health. And honey's good. You put in all kinds of stuff. Barbecue ribs, everything, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> it really is good. 
good. Now, you can do all kinds of stuff with that. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul if you have found it. Listen to this. If you have found it. Why? Because you know what? Some people don't care for wisdom. Some people don't want it. When you go and try to help someone and you try to say, hey, listen, maybe you should consider this. Ah, get, get out of here with that. You, you know anybody like that? Don't, don't look around right now in the room. Just stay right here. Just look up here. But how, do you know somebody like that? That they just don't want to listen to you. They think you're, you know, I don't know. Maybe your wisdom is not good enough for them. But, but that is the typical way of man to resist and reject wisdom. Listen, even to the point of that warning in Proverbs chapter 18 in verse 1, I believe it is. Yes, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires and he rages against all wise or wisdom, all wise judgments. He has no desire for it. There are people who just don't want to hear from the God. There are people who don't want to hear from the word of God. You were a person at one time that didn't want anything to do with the Bible because you didn't understand who the Lord was. And now look at you. Look at you. You're at church on a Sunday night. Two times in one day if you came this morning. If not, you're not in the in crowd. It's okay, it's okay to go to church two times in one day, okay? It's okay. As a matter of fact, you should desire to be in the Word of God. And Some people say things like, why do you go to church twice in one day? Because we're studying two different books of the Bible, and I want to grow in the Word of God. I always get excited when people ask me, so the evening service? I'm like, yeah. Is it the same message as the morning services? And I said, no, it's a whole other book of the Bible. It's a whole different message. And we'll even feed you if you come after service. <laughs> they never come. But the ones who desire the pure milk of the word of God, who want to go from drinking that meat to chewing, or drinking that milk to chewing on that meat, they'll come, they'll partake, they'll receive. If you have found it, there is a prospect. There is a latter end. And your hope, listen to this, will not be cut off. The Bible says about the latter end in chapter 23 and verse 18, for surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. Notice how the Lord is saying your hope will not be cut off. You will be sustained. You will be secure. Your latter end. Your future hope will not be cut off. I would say, and I don't think I'm stretching the text here, but I would say that this supports the eternal security of the believer. I don't think I'm stretching it too far. If you remain in the wisdom of God, you will never be cut off. Like Jesus says, those whom the Father has given me, none can pluck them from my hand. Not only is it safe in safety, but it's as sweet as honey. Look at what else he goes on to say here. In the 27th saying, verse 15, he says, Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. This is a warning to the wicked, okay? God will deal with the wicked and redeem the righteous. Yes, there will be times where the wicked, it seems like, is taking advantage of the righteous, overcoming them, hurting them, harming them. And this warning to the wicked is that God will redeem his people. God will vindicate them. And it's also an encouragement to the righteous to... Let the Lord take care of those things. Let God render his justice and do that. Let the Lord take care of it. Let God do it. Listen, you know, this is something that we wrestle with the most. We want to deal with wickedness, but God says he will take care of it. Here, this proverb is saying this very clearly here and attempting to destroy righteousness. The Lord's saying, hey, listen, I'll take care of this. Verse 16 says, For a righteous man may fall seven times, often or many. 
and rise again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. In other words, the wicked will suffer greatly and they will be found under God's judgment with no hope. But the righteous have a hope even if they fall or are overtaken by the unrighteous. Often or many times, our assurance is that the Lord will deliver us. Remember how the Lord worked in the lives of his servants. And we see how God ministers to the lives of his people. You know, one of the things that I think oftentimes we fail to consider in all of this is some of the stories that we find in the Bible that show us this picture here. And one of the stories that comes to mind is a story found in the book of Daniel. And remember in Daniel chapter 3, we had the story of uh, Daniel and his friends. Boy, they had a rough time in Babylon. But I'll tell you what, the Lord always delivered them, right? God always did a work in their life. And, 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 and notice here that, that they were always faced with this opposition, always put in a position where Daniel and his friends, whether it was him or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were always faced with it. Daniel had a a problem. Him and his friends were promoted and, and, and God had blessed them and, you know, did a work in them because they trusted the Lord. But in chapter three, we see that the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he made this image. And his desire was to really caused the people to worship this image and bow down to it. And ultimately, we see here that the wicked was plundering the resting place of the righteous. And we see that the story goes that Daniel clearly would not bow down to this image. The story then goes on to say that Daniel and his friends disobeyed the king and then they were put in the fiery furnace, right? And the Lord delivered them. God was their deliverer. Ultimately, what was happening with, in Daniel chapter 3, you could read the chapter in its entirety, verses 1 through 30, but, but you'll see here is that ultimately the Lord, well, he dealt with the wicked. Because when the wicked try to unjustly deal with the righteous, it turned back on the wicked. Calamity came upon the wicked. And who was killed in Daniel chapter 3? Not Daniel or his friends. But the wicked man that bound them to throw them in the fiery furnace. And it was ordered by the king to put it seven times hotter. And his men were killed, killed, the wicked men. The same picture is found in the book of Daniel as well later on in a couple of chapters after this. In chapter 6, the plot against Daniel. Daniel then thrown in the lion's den. Remember that? And Daniel was saved from the lions. And ultimately what we see is the Lord gives Daniel favor in verse 24, kind of like the same thing where those in Daniel 3 were killed, the wicked. The wicked were also killed in chapter 6, the ones that accused Daniel. Their wives and children were thrown in this den and the lions ripped them apart. So the Lord is saying, leave those things to me, I'll take care of it for you. I mean, that is the end of the wicked, destruction by God, calamity. That's why the Bible says, for the wicked, and this means this, that doesn't mean that if the wicked turn to the Lord and repent, that God will not forgive. God will forgive, but if they don't, they continue in their wickedness and they're bent on destroying the righteous, then God's like, I'll take care of this. I will deal with it. That's why today when you see all this going on and you're saying, oh man, you know, the church, we better do this and we better do that. Yes, we need to be informed, but don't make that your God. Worship Jesus. And if you think the enemy is winning, don't worry about that. God's going to take care of it. He already knows the outcome. That doesn't mean we're not to do anything. Like right now, 
you know, people are just, everything, just the moment you turn on the TV, it's all about, you know, this voting that's, you know, supposed to be done by the 14th, I think, this, this recall. And if you haven't been, maybe you're getting text messages telling you you need to go and vote. Anybody been getting those? videos and all these things. How do these people get my number? How do they know what I am or what I do or what I believe? Anyways, does it matter? You see this and there's a side of Christianity that's saying we need to do something about this because if not, then you better say goodbye to Christianity in California. Well, say goodbye to it. I, I'm not worried about that. The Bible tells me that a day is going to come when we will be persecuted and sought after because we will be hated by the world. Why am I trying to preserve or prolong something that God is doing? What I need to do is not worried about how long I can hold on and live in my cute little Christian bubble. What I need to do is learn to trust Jesus regardless of what's taking place around me. Now, will I vote? Absolutely. I think as Christians, you should use your freedoms and your liberties that we have in this country while they're here, but we can't change what God has already purposed and determined in this state, in this country, for the church. And just need I remind you that 10 years ago, there was no doubt that we were the world power. In this last year, we're no longer that world power. And it seems like the church is worried about that. Why? We're not in Bible prophecy. So there has to come a point where either we as a nation diminish in our power so that the nations that are in Bible prophecy can do. And you want to know what those nations that are? You know what's interesting? Ten years ago, unheard of. Now today, they're becoming the world power. And the church is like, oh, oh my goodness, we need to get out there. Listen, God already has it all worked out. The 28th saying, verse 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. You, you know, this is, this is an interesting thing. I think sometimes it's okay to call out the injustices that some people are doing. Now, I, I want to I I share with this here because, you know, there is a thing going on right now where pastors are taking the time over the pulpit, even dear friends within the movement I am a part of, Calvary Chapel, it bothers me that they actually take the time to make fun and ridicule, talk about a person's attentive span and or they're a little bit slow and they make fun of this person who is known as the President of the United States. Why would you waste precious time over the pulpit to name call the President of this country? I, I didn't vote for him, I'm just saying, the Bible says we are to pray for the leaders of the nation, not make fun of them. I just don't understand it. And I can assure you this, that those that do that, mark my words, if this were to happen, it's not, but I'm just saying, I'm not prophesying or anything like that. But <laughs> if something bad were to happen to this guy, in some sinful way, the church will gloat in his fall. I know, because they're already making fun of him over the pulpit. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Do we worship our feelings and our convictions? <laughs> hey, listen, I've been told all kinds of stuff because I don't use politics over this pulpit. They say, why don't you? I say, because I'm from the hood, man. We don't trip on that stuff, man. <laughs> I'm an old cholo, man. What do I know, you know? How do you feel about welfare? I'm like, EBT, it's all good. It's like a credit card. You know, come on, man. Dude, we'll make it happen. 
how do you feel about this? And all social and jazz and all this. And I'm just like, listen, just keep your eyes on Jesus, man. Ain't none of that stuff ever helped me when I was in prison in my addiction. But Jesus did. You know, somebody asked me a question when a lot of the Christians were being driven out of the Middle East. Remember, they were decapitating a lot of them. We were seeing a lot of the stuff online, right? And somebody, very honest person came to me and they says, you know, I'm so upset with what's going on. I says, many of us are. And he says, well, I just need to, I need some wisdom. And I says, what is it? They says, I need to know how to pray. And I was about to say, well, just pray. But they says, but I want you to understand what I'm about to say. Do I pray for those at, that are chopping the heads off of Christians? And I stopped. And I says, yeah, I think so. And they said, okay, so then I will pray for their salvation. And I said, whoa. My prayer would be like, Lord, get them. Because that's, you could support that biblically. David prayed that way. You know, bust their mouth and break their teeth and all this. David was on it, man. That guy, whew, he's like, and Lord, if you don't do it, let me do it. <laughs> I mean, David was, he was just a whole other guy, right? But these imprecatory prayers, right? Jesus prayed those too. Listen to this. I just told this person, I says, wow, that, I wasn't expecting that, but yes, do that. There is an apostle in the Bible who was just as bad as these that are doing that. His name was Saul of Tarsus. Somebody prayed for Saul. He murdered a lot of Christians, sent many to prison, women and children included. Later on in his epistle to Timothy, he says, it's just my paraphrase and my visual for you. I did all this in ignorance with tears in his eyes and weeping. He could never make up what he did in the flesh. He could only rest in the grace of God and the forgiveness of his sins. But boy, did he not live a life willing to die for what he was willing to kill for, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when your enemy falls, do not rejoice and do not let your heart be glad. This is somewhat of a superior attitude than others. And God doesn't want us to have that. Listen to this. Lest the Lord see it and it displease him. This means that if you do this, God's disgusted with this. And listen to this. And he turn away his wrath from him. So when you're over here making fun of and making light of, the person that you disagree with making the decisions for this country, listen, and you claim to be the voice for the church in this nation, let me explain something to you. Guess what God will do? Because he's displeased and disgusted with that, his favor will turn toward the one that you're making fun of. And he will remove his wrath. I, I just, you either believe the word or you don't. Just let that sit there. You guys chew on that and, Chew on it like a cow. Long. I just... Mm. The rejoicing of the righteous over the enemies falling. From what I gather from these verses, this might be a little bit too... I don't think I'm stretching the text, but here's the thought that I had. The rejoicing over your enemies when he falls could be as serious as the sin that they've committed for their fall. Oh man, that's a good word. Be careful. So what do we do then? We pray. Well, I don't agree with what they're doing. You don't have to, but you can pray. As we're drawing to a close, the 29th saying says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. The word to be envious of the wicked really means to desire what they have, want what the wicked have. I, 
No righteous man wants that. Listen to this. Do not fret because of evildoers. You know what the word fret means? It means to bubble up, to get red. You know somebody that when they get mad, they turn red? He's saying, don't, don't do that. Don't fret because of evildoers. When I thought of that verse there, when I looked at it, actually, I thought of this verse here. David wrote this psalm, Psalm 37. David said, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. David said the same thing. This is probably one of the wise sayings of Solomon, right, that he got from his father, David. But David says, don't be envious. Why? For they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. What is he saying? The atrocities and the evil and the wickedness that you see will be short-lived. It has an expiration date. It's not going to be forever. So don't come undone over something that you can't fix. Don't come undone over something that it is what it is, and you just trust God. Don't come undone over things that you have no control over because you're not sovereign. God is. So you might say, then what do I do? All mad, you know? I can't be mad now. Now I have to, what do you want me to do, rejoice? I mean, well, you could. <laughs> Might look a little crazy, but you'll be all right. Or you can, verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. And dwell on the land and feed on his faithfulness. Try that on. Do that. Rather than fret because of evildoers, okay, they're doing evil, they're doing wicked. Yes, pray for them. You just keep your eyes on the Lord, serve God. And you know what people are like? I got friends that pastor all over in different states and everything. And then they call me and they're like, hey, you know, how are things going? How's the church? They're like, how's California? I'm like, I don't know. Ask her. I see all kinds of crazy things going on. I says, well, you know more than me. Well, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm fine. Yeah. Well, don't you live in California? Yeah, I do. I live in Bloomington. It's a very nice city. A lot of animals there. <laughs> I just says, yeah, I live here, but I'm not like, I don't know what you're asking me. They says, well, aren't you feeling it? Feeling what? I probably feel more pressure from the church than the world. I says, well, I'm just trusting in the Lord and doing good. I'm, I'm having fun. So don't fret, but trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as light and your justice as as the noonday, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. As, as some pastors today sound so angry. Are you guys seeing that? Anybody? Upset? And why? Why? Like, relax, dude. Don't fret. David would be like, don't fret. He says as he closes this, don't fret. It only causes harm. They're going to age quicker, man. They're going to get crow's feet and everything all around their eyes. They're going to be 40 years old looking like they're 80. All because they're worried about something they have no control over. When I used to get mad as a little boy and I wanted people to know I'd you know, do that. You know that. My grandmother used to stare at me. She raised me most of my life. And she would look at me and she would tell me in Spanish, you keep your face like that. It's going to stay like that. And I'd go like this and I'd go. <laughs> I didn't want to look like that. <laughs> There's some truth to that. For there will be no prospect for the evil man. So the righteous have a future and a hope, but the wicked don't. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. There is no future. There is no hope. 
Listen to this. So do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. Don't get all undone because it looks like the wicked is prospering. We've talked about that verse this morning. Psalm 73. And listen to this. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of it. It will soon be cut short. But there is hope. Proverbs 23, 18 says this for you and me, for surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. Chapter 24 and verse 14 also says this. If you have found it wisdom, there is a later, a ladder and there is a prospect and your hope will not be cut off. But for the wicked, it will be. Now, as we close tonight, the 30th saying says, My son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those given to change, for their calamity will rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin those two can bring. Let me read that again. We just talked about don't fret of evildoers. We just talked about not rejoicing over your enemies falling. Don't. Listen, my son, fear the Lord, number one. Fear the Lord. And notice that the word king here is lowercase, not capital.